uh, welcome uh, Tenakatu Katoa uh, to the uh, February meeting of the Community Strategy Committee. Um, we've obviously got some of our participants and welcome to the people that are here in chambers. We're also under our red light settings. We've also got some members that are coming in through Zoom who are working from home uh, and obviously some members of the Youth Council who I believe are online as well. So uh, we've got a fairly uh, mixed agenda this afternoon on uh, some very interesting reports. Um, firstly, we'll just go through the apologies. I've got apologies from uh, Councillor Phillips and Councillor Bolger. Um, just confirming whether Councillor Grant may be online or Councillor Davis may be on the Zoom. I'm not sure how we... I think we'd that. see them if they were. Yeah. So we'll log them as an apology anyway mm. at this stage. So that um, moves us into our agenda uh, for today. And our first item um, is the uh, progress report from the Gore Youth Council. And as I said earlier, welcome to hopefully our youth council members that, um, that are, are leaving, um, Sarah, Jake, and what else we've got, we've got uh, Jessica and Georgia, uh, Georgie. So, uh, is Mark, so I'm trying to work out where I look to see anyone. I can look over this way and see you, Mark. How are you, Mark? Um, I'll leave uh, you to lead us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Afternoon, everyone. Good to see you all. Um, so, with regards to the uh, 2021 report, um, um, it's been a very challenging year for everyone, including the Youth Council, um, having to constantly adapt to COVID restrictions. However, they've still managed to organise a number of events, often in collaboration with other organisations or groups. And they then reflected on these events and discussed how to prove, improve or change them for the future. And over the year, we've seen a, a real increased confidence in the members and a group of young people ready to take things to that next level, which is really exciting. And so moving into the new year, um, again, we have to adapt to the current climate. However, um, we are really excited to announce that this year we'll have a youth council with 21 members that is more representative of the community itself, um, including more community members, um, a voice for Maori, a voice for people with disabilities, and a voice for newcomers as well. Um, to reflect everyday organisational structures, the, the youth council has set up a, a project management group communications group and an events management group and this will give each member of the youth council an, an increased sense of responsibility and um, envisaged also increases their ability to operate and support the community. Um, to support this, guest speakers have been invited to share their knowledge and skills online to enable youth councillors to grow in those roles. Um, I'd like to say a, a huge thank you to councillor Nick Grant online at the moment for all his support and guidance over the last year the, uh, the members of the council really enjoy his um, yeah, guidance and company and sense of humor um, and i'd like to ask the mayor now to thank the four people who have left the council at the end of 2021 uh, they've all been invited to listen in on the youtube channel so i'm sure Well, thank you, Mark. And um, yeah, it is a real pleasure to be able to thank uh, those that are moving on from Youth Council this year. Um, I know that the contribution that they've made is one that's been really appreciated. Um, but I'm just hoping that uh, through their time on Youth Council, they've uh, gained a whole lot of experience and skills, developed skills that they wouldn't otherwise have had. And I know that each one of them uh, has got, you know, we've all got our individual traits, but each one of them have brought um, variety and, um, and energy to, uh, to the Youth Council over the last year or more, uh, and uh, I really wish them all the very best uh, for what is ahead of them. And, and I know that a number will be moving away, moving out of the district, uh, which in some ways is a shame, but actually you've got to move away before you can come back. And, and I know that they'll, when they do go away, they'll gain a lot of skills and experience, but I'm hoping that they will gain an appreciation of what this community can do for, or has done for them 
and, and what they can possibly do to add to the, the value uh, proposition that this community has. So wish them all the very best, hope it goes well, um, but please remember us uh, as, uh, as time goes on. And to, to Sarah, Jake, Jessica and Georgie, yeah, all the very best from me, and I, I say that with sincerity on behalf of the whole of the Gore District Council. Uh, we've enjoyed your time, um, and we appreciate the energy you've brought, um, and, and I hope that the world works the best that possibly, or you work in the world the best you possibly can um, from here on in. So, all the best. And, and I guess just before uh, I finish talking about Youth Council, I just want to um, add my congratulations to Mark, who, who picked up the role of connecting this whole group uh, earlier on this year and done a fantastic job and uh, looking at those, um, you know, those project groups that you've, you've set up with the um, communications, project management and, and events. That's really going to give the Youth Council going forward something to get their teeth into quite definitive um, and I look forward to see what, what comes out of that. And to Nick, uh, from a, a governance perspective, the input that he's contributed, incredibly value and, uh, valuable and I, and I hope that he's gained uh, value uh, in reverse. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Your Worship and uh, Mark, um, and obviously from the uh, the actual uh, community strategy committee, the same thing. Uh, I think just reinforcing what Amir said that the individual contribution from each of the, um, the youth councillors that goes together into one um, one big pool and actually um, comes out the other end with all that value that has been added to um, to to the group, and it's great to see that uh, we've got um, a large number of uh, you know, through for the next year, and all those um, diverse groups that they're going to cover off. Uh, I don't think it was this group. I think it was a previous group. We had that speed dating or that speed discussion night um, with the council, the youth council. It was um, it was fascinating the insight. Um, and sometimes we uh, we forget that the younger community has a, a lot of very valuable ideas that they uh, introduce to us. When we get a bit older, you forget um, some of the. Uh, some of the ideas and issues that are out there. So, uh, no, a great thanks. So, um, really recommend that, um, just have someone recommend that that uh, report. Uh, I'll, I'll move the adoption of the report. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. And um, seconded by um, Councillor Reid. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Mark, for the report. Great job, keep it up. And I'm sure that if Nick was online, he'd be saying the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, moving on to our next agenda item is our guests that have come to Chambers. We've got the Great South and obviously uh, an update on our services. And we, I think we have Graham, Steve, Bobby and Ben um, from the Great South team. So welcome to a very light chamber here. Um, and the, uh, the floor is yours for an update. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yeah, it's our pleasure to be here, and thanks very much for your, your time and this opportunity. Um, I'm conscious already, which is the very worst thing to do and when you're starting a PowerPoint presentation, that there's quite a lot of content in here. Um, so we will be moving through pretty quickly. Um, the team will present their respective sections. Um, but much of the opportunity, I'm sure, is just to share with you what we're up to, but also to answer any questions that you might have. So we'd, we'd, we'd welcome any questions as we go. So the, the first bit is just um, somewhat of an introduction to uh, present our uh, current and future activity in the district. Um, you know, I think, already about us, even better lives through sustainable development is, our, is the vision um, for, for Great South for the region. Um, and building a connected, contemporary and competitive Southland region um, through these uh, core areas um, of activity which we'll be touching on today. Um, this is the team. Uh, Tim Mackay is the only uh, senior leadership team member not here today. Um, in the interests of the 
uh, our health and safety, um, and he's you know, preparing some financials for the board next week, which is um, pretty critical. So um, this is um, our funding from the Gore District um, in this uh, current year, uh, core funding and contract funding, as you can see. Um, our total funding, just to give some perspective, is around $7 million. Um, those of you who are eagle-eyed will notice that that um, pie chart is actually in, sort of in reverse. Um, our council funding comes for about $3 million. We get other sources of funding of about $4 million um, at this stage. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Bobby Brown, who's the GM of uh, Tourism and Events, to run through her content. Cool. Um, kia ora koutou. Nice to be here. Um, I'm just going to whip through this pretty quick, as Graham said, but of course any questions or afterwards, if anyone wants to ask anything, it'd be great. Okay, so probably the short version of this is that there has been a lot of marketing and campaigning happening, um, especially as people have been dreaming of where they could go, if they could travel. So it has been important to kind of keep that consistent messaging so Southland is front of mind for people, whether they're domestic or international. We've obviously just tried to make that make sense with budgets and timing as well. So domestic is the focus, uh, and in particular drive markets. Um, the Auckland flight returning to Invercargill has been useful, um, and we did see a good influx when that started again. But again, we're just thinking in the near future of the markets that can come here easily. And then there's a bit of a plan for the next 12 months about how we're going to target new markets, particularly when borders open. So the two, mar uh, two campaigns in market are your due south. So there's some billboards, um, website stuff there. Um, Gore is definitely included there with um, Maruawai, so there's a teaser for that, as well as fishing and heritage. Um, lots of stuff to do with media, so everybody's bombarded with um, things that they could do, where they could go, and we've found that the Gore posts have been quite popular. Uh, I won't go into too much there. Um, backing up the fact that we have been promoting, and um, we've seen increased traffic to the website. Um, so that's Southland NZ, our regional destination site, and that, that does show that people are looking and in particular Southland does have a lot of appeal because of open spaces, um, people want to connect with nature, they want to travel with family or their partner, and we do offer that. Uh, yeah, there's lots to do with supporting businesses and operators at the moment. Um, a lot of them are at this point where as we go into year three, that they, they're really struggling. Um, the domestic market is, is not enough to sustain a lot of them and they haven't been able to pivot from an international market. Uh, so we are partnering with the regional business partner team to deliver targeted business by business support as well as workshops um, that help improve digital capability, which this is what the slide shows. Okay, just quickly through a couple of things around how we're still trying to develop the destination while we have closed borders. Um, you will see this thing which we did a couple of years ago, uh, and that's been very useful because that's provided leadership and clarity on how we are resetting tourism and the recovery from COVID. So we've reviewed that, and that will be reviewed again as part of the Just Transitions long-term plan process, particularly as we look at sustainability, decarbonisation, and to see how businesses have actually fared out of COVID. Uh, for Gore, agritourism is a really key pillar for you guys, um, and it was a feature in the Your Due South campaign. Food, uh, we had a great workshop um, end of last year here, uh, and the Marilwai Centre, of course, is going to be quite pivotal in being a point um, of focus. Um, Rurawai, I keep saying that lots, but obviously it's a key project for you and it's actually a key project for the region. So we're really looking forward and we keep in touch with Jim and the team quite a lot to understand how they're progressing. And we're looking at some joint marketing when the time is right to help really push that product um, to different markets. Uh, the other two things to mention is um, I'd just like to acknowledge Anne. Anne's our key person that we, well, I work with um, from a planning and tourism events perspective and we've just about we've finished two bits of work for you guys um, around looking at the rail and aviation heritage opportunities at Mandeville 
and also just a bit that we've received this weekend around the brown trout investigation. Um, so thanks to those who were involved, there were a mixture of councillors, staff, and particularly the brown trout piece of work had quite an extensive community um, involvement. So those two bits of work um, we've facilitated on your behalf and they'll come back to council now for you to review and to see what you'd like to do next. Yep, some future opportunities as we look forward. Um, cycling is big. Um, but we're seeing huge growth if you're trying to buy a bike at the moment. It's a wee bit tricky, depending on the type of bike. And sustainability, particularly around um, as the region looks at decarbonisation, um, but also we're getting visitors who want to give back um, to the place they're visiting or they want to understand um, their impact. So that is a big focus for us and that again aligns up to other goals with the Net Zero Southland, focus within Great South, carbon neutral advantage and of course what's happening nationally with decarbonisation. Mm. Oh, still going. Events, right. So this sector's probably been the hardest hit. Um, so again, we had a good strategy, a guiding document, which has provided a bit of leadership. Um, but it's really tricky because if, yeah, for event organisers, we're seeing a lot of tiredness. Um, even if they can hold an event, um, people's lives are upside down at the moment. So they're thinking twice about you know, whether they want to go through the stress or the risk attached to volunteering to hold an event. So a lot of the cancellations we've seen have been based on that as much as the fact that you can only get 100 people in an event. So it's very complex and difficult for people to run events at the moment. And I know this is of huge importance to Gore because you are, um, you know, very a, a key events destination for us in Southland. However, we have tried to support 42 events. Um, and remember, the focus here was to look at it from a, um, to try to use the event to bring people to the region as much as for Southlanders to enjoy a special part of our way of life. And there's been quite a few obviously based around here. You've got some fantastic event committees and volunteers in your region, which I think you all know. Um, besides that, there's a whole lot of other stuff um, there. I won't go all through that, but again, similar to tourism, events continue to be marketed. They're part of how we position the region and that means we try to get it in things like Kiora magazine, um, you know, radio, TV slots, all that. So that's all happening quite a bit. Um, and yeah, that just sort of talks about the fact we're trying to cluster some events together to lower the risk for event organisers, but to also try to get people to stay for a whole weekend, stay longer and spend more. <coughs> Uh, so there's a few examples there and a lot more coming up. And again, just to acknowledge um, Anne with her role with supporting us with allocation of the Regional Events Fund. So this was 50 million that the government allocated after the first lockdown to really help regions use events to sell the destination. So Anne sits on the advisory group um, with Steve Gibling from ICC and a couple of Great South people. And we've allocated um, also all of it, just about all of our allocations so far to about 30 events from memory. But um, it's been a good process and thanks Anne for your contribution. Oh, still going. Still going. Last one. So look, this is just one slide and what it is saying is that business events are a key part of our future uh, focus. And the reason for this is that we're seeing a lot of visiting friends and family, and these people don't often stay in commercial accommodation. So to balance that out, um, the business event sector does use commercial. So again, it's just part of this bigger strategic approach. So of course, we've had quite a few cancel, but to be honest, it's really positive looking forward. There's a lot of interest in Invercargill and Southland um, as a good place to come and do business. And we're quite attractive because of our pre and post for mill opportunities. So there's lots of cool stuff to do and we like that because they can extend their length of stay. Okay, so over to uh, Ben Lewis. Kia ora koutou. Uh, so I'm Ben Lewis, GM of Business Services. I uh, manage the business services team and a team of staff working on labour market issues and programmes. Um, I'll just provide a bit of background on um, the services that we have in my team. 
and a few highlights of the last year. So uh, we hold the Great South holds the South and contract for the National Regional Business Partner Program. And we know that small business plays a, a crucial part in the South and economy. So we have a team of three growth advisors and they offer specialist uh, free business advice and support. They provide um, management capability funding for small business, which is subsidised by 50%. And they offer a free uh, business mentoring service and research and development funding through um, uh, Callahan Innovation. So on top of this sort of core work that our team has been busy, like our team's been very busy since COVID, delivering COVID-19 advisory support to small businesses. And that included expert professional and free advice on things like business continuity, cash flow management, strategy, marketing, et cetera. Um, you know, that was vitally important to keep our businesses functioning through this COVID period. And we distributed, distributed over 1 million of COVID advisory funding uh, to over 400 South and businesses. Um, from August 2020, 2021, sorry, uh, the team has been responsible for a new part of funding through the um, through MB uh, for the five hardest hit regions of the South Island. And that includes Fiordland and the Southern District Rating Area. That doesn't include Gore and Invercargill. Uh, but that's a significant amount of funding. And to date, we have distributed over $350,000 to over 80 businesses, uh, predominantly in the Tiano area, which has been the most hard hit. Look, we know it's not a silver bullet for businesses, but um, we're re I'm really proud of what the team's done to date in that space. Um, you can see our team have also visited, our growth advisor have visited, um, oh, sorry, I can't quite read this. Uh, yeah, there it is. Our team have visited Gore uh, three times from March to June 2021. So they um, came here and um, offered free business meetings out of this building. Um, and we'll be looking to do that more in the new year as well. We didn't have as much uptake as we would have liked, but um, we just think there's different economics happening in the Gore sector as opposed to Tiano and Invercargill. Um, so we think there's plenty to offer this, this Gore area, including uh, business assessments, capability funding, R&D funding. So our team are gonna work a bit more on connecting into that area this year, um, increase our presence, and um, we also wanna run some business seminars and workshops, although we're, we're very aware of what's happening with Omicron, which is not the most useful to plan at the moment. So the other area of Great South that I manage is the labour market team. And one of the main areas of uh, activity in that team is the South New Futures program. Uh, we have uh, a team of four staff working in that space. It's a PGF funded aspirational program which aims to build employment pathways for youth across Southland. It's ultimately focused on retaining youth in our region. Um, we work with young people in Southland to provide career op opportunities. We work with schools, training providers, employers, industry organisations and government agencies. The programme's been running for five years and in 2020 it increased from one to four staff through that PGF funding. We achieve our goals through coordinate employer talks in schools, workplace visits, organising the industry sector days, uh, employability Skills Workshop through the Youth Passport Program, and we work with employers through our Employer Excellence Part uh, Program as well. So we meet quite regularly with um, uh, the staff at Gore DC, including uh, Anne and Mark. It's been great to work with you guys. I'd like to give you a, a bit of a shout out as well. Also Lisa from um, Hokanui, Huanui, we catch up with regularly as well just to get synergy between our organisations and, and events across Southland. Uh, so just on Hakanui Huanui, I see that as quite a different program to Youth Futures, and it's quite a complementary program. Um, Hakanui Huanui is much more focused on individualised one-on-one -on -one support for high-risk students, and Youth Futures delivers a much larger scale modules and events to a much broader group of high school students, um, trying to catch them before they might fall off the cliff, so to speak. I'll just go into a little bit more detail on the Youth Futures um, Work Ready Passport Program, because that's quite a big piece of our work going forward. Uh, so we run a, a series of modules at high school um, students, delivered by Youth Futures staff, uh, also in conjunction with other local business and entities such as Jubilee Budgeting, Adventure Southland and Active Southland. The modules are focused on writing a CV, interview skills, understanding health and safety, 
the key employability skills of attitude and communication, teamwork, personal well-being, and so forth. We've had an extremely positive uh, response from Aurora and James Hargis to date, and they're wanting us to roll that out across much more of their classes. And we have Gore High School booked in to deliver the Work Ready Passport Program in Terms 2 and 3, and this will be delivered to senior gateway students. Um, so you can also see up there some of the uh, other recent activity in Gore, um, including uh, just one key highlight was the, the Summer of Work program that the team undertook recently. It was a virtual job fair connecting Southland youth with local jobs for um, summer. It was done through online video connections. We had over 500 vacancies uh, through 25 employers and we placed over 60 students into work, into summer work. Uh, a couple of other roles I'll just touch on is our um, primary sector workforce coordinator role. Uh, that was a role that was funded through MPI after COVID. Um, and we know that um, you know, the primary sector has had low levels of staff retention and attraction. And our aim has been to upskill primary sector managers um, on and owners on recruitment, HR, coaching, and legal requirements. So you can see there we had a, a couple of um, workshops which we actually held in Gore as well um, on the 4th of March and the 5th of May on uh, recruitment tools and also setting up your new employers for success. So that role was actually a one-year role funded by MPI but has just finished at the end of last year. Um, we also have our skills placement program coordinator and that's a, a role that connects newcomers like migrants into uh, work opportunities. Um, since the border has closed, that role has had a shift to focus on support for migrants who have lived in New Zealand for some time, um, but we've been working in that space. Uh, we've worked the last 12 months with over 200 migrants on a one-to-one -one basis and worked with 77 partners of skilled migrants. And through that role, we've collaborated with Hokanui Huanui, closing the gaps through the job search um, in 2021. And we're running a free workshop in Gore in May on intercultural communication by a communications expert, Steph Holloway. And just finally for me, um, we also work with our seven central government agencies and partners. Um, one example is we work closely with MB on, the, on setting up the Interim Regional Skills Leadership Group. And I'm actually a, a member now, a permanent member on that group. So we provide them with regular updates on labour market needs and, and trends. And that regional skills leadership group is currently developing a regional workforce development plan for Southland. Um, and that's going to be something that's regularly updated every year and be a, a really useful document for us going forward as a region. Uh, we also feed into uh, local insights reports from that group, which are read at a ministerial level regularly. And finally, um, the labour market attraction section. Um, we're obviously working on how to attract people to our region. Um, it's of course a major challenge to our region and it is across all regions of New Zealand. We recognise that more work needs to be done in this space, but it, it's worth mentioning that we, as an organisation, we're not specifically funded by our stakeholders or central government for this activity. So we haven't had to, we haven't been able to jump into it as much as we would have liked, but an example of our work is um, last year we ran a small advertising campaign in the New Zealand Herald focused on attracting North Islanders to live in Southland. Um, and that was quite a, a good little campaign we did. So that is it from me. Thanks for listening today. And over to you, Steve. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Kura Kato, Steve Kenny, uh, GM Strategic Projects. Just a quick update and a little bit of a follow-up on um, our previous uh, presentation <coughs> on last visit. We've um, stepped forward in a number of very significant areas and areas that are relevant to, particularly to Gore. Uh, just, a, just an insight, uh, we have developed now 13 individual data sets for um, Southland across the board. And uh, those data sets have all been cleaned and now are available for councils to use as part of their daily um, planning processes. We are developing a portal to gain access to that at, um, at present, and uh, that's just a, probably another 12 weeks away, um, subject to completing the funding. 
However, we are happy to um, work with council planners and so on to, to uh, train them in the use of those tools um, in the interim. Just uh, at our last visit, we presented the Southland um, COVID scenario response. And as you know, uh, we, uh, we have last, in the beginning of this year, we moved ahead of where we were expected to be in 2025 in terms of recovery. The Southland region, regional economy having increased by just over $100 million uh, to, to an excess of uh, 6.5 six, seven billion, which is very significant, <coughs> primarily, primarily on the strength of uh, the primary sector and primary sector exports, uh, commodity pricing and construction. Um, that is continuing and has um, put us in quite a strong position as a, as a regional economy in spite of COVID and the challenges associated with that. Across the board, as a region, we are um, facing a housing shortage. Um, the total number of houses short is around 1,700 as it stands today. A uh, very significant increase in every region, Gore included. As you know, uh, the average rental price in Gore since 2018 has increased with more than 45%. The um, settlement date uh, time for House sales has gone from, uh, has decreased by 10 days to less than 33 days between listing and confirmation of finance, um, and in many cases, it's much less than that. Uh, we have a uh, waiting list for social emergency housing of um, 18 applications. I think there was some recent media on that. Um, the, 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 the fact is, however, that uh, Gore District has a very low level of investment in public housing as it stands. I think it's about five point five per thousand population when the average is 12.88. Um, so there is a, a need for additional servicing and investment in this area of activity. The average um, ownership of houses has increased to private ownership. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a greater number of um, non-occupied uh, residential dwellings in 2018 that has changed in uh, 2021. The detail of this work, um, we're going to sit down with Anne and the team and share in detail, and uh, there will be some significant insights that come out of that. Just uh, the Carbon Neutral Advantage Program. Uh, we presented last time the, um, the Net Zero Southland report, which really sets the uh, footprint in, a, of our existing emissions and also a pathway forward. We have uh, close to 100 businesses now looking at decarbonisation, and. Well, you may well ask, why is, why is this important? Well, today um, the cost of carbon is $86.25, and that means for every tonne of carbon you uh, burn, you're spending $153 uh, per tonne in emissions as, as part of the cost of that fuel. So it is a very significant barrier to particularly export industries and export businesses in this area, um, and, uh, and the whole of South and uh, generally speaking. Uh, we've worked with a number of a uh, number of local businesses to look at um, decarbonisation. Um, Heartland, uh, Croydon would be one example. Um, Matara Valley Dairy, and we've put some input into some of the design of the new school at, um, in Gore. So look, we we have lots of other um, interested areas, and we plan to run workshops in Gore specifically for businesses interested in decarbonisation over the next eight weeks. Uh, just uh, quick, I, I won't, I won't, I've covered this primarily, now there's some of the examples of the um, areas of focus that we have um, worked on. I have to just uh, point out we're also as a region uh, looking at um, hydrogen transport fuels. We are highly exposed to the cost of um, fossil fuels and also um, scarcity of fuel with the passage of time. So. As, a, um, as an alternative, we have a unique opportunity in Southland, I would say unique, uh, to leverage um, new hydrogen transport fuel opportunities and we're working in a very constructive way towards uh, the establishment of a multi-billion dollar uh, fuel production facility here in the, in the province. It's early days, but um, however, that's important. The other really critical uh, fact is, and you'll note on the PowerPoint slide, it says $84 a tonne for carbon. It's 86 uh, 25 or 86 45 today, actually. By the way, um, just to give you an idea of the volatility of that, that has increased $20 in about um, three weeks. 
Um, so that's a significant um, cost to business. But um, the other perverse effect of, um, of high carbon prices is this uh, desire to develop and build and um, plant very large carbon forests. And already uh, the triggers generally are that at $50 a tonne, land, sheep and beef land in particular, but not necessarily exclusively above 15 degrees, farmers, if they wanted to get a, uh, the best return, they could plant that in, in carbon forest and, and increase their current return over their existing activity. At $70 a tonne, sheep and beef on uh, flat grazing land converted to forestry becomes very appealing for the individual farmers. At $104 a tonne, uh, poor performing or constrained dairy farm conversion to um, carbon forest is a significant, significant um, issue. Now, uh, we, we, we're really concerned about this. We know there are some significant environmental and climate change benefits of having uh, more forestry in, in each region, uh, particularly in marginal lands, riparian strips, wetlands and, and um, conservation state and even public other public lands. But when you remove productive uh, farmland out of production, there is a very significant impact on the local economy and the communities across the board. Uh, we, we've, as I think we may have mentioned this in our last presentation, we, the first piece of economic and social impact work we expect to have completed on Friday of this week, and we hope to map the likely impacts across um, each, of the, each of the regions so that you as councils and uh, regulators and so on have a really clear understanding of the likely implications of um, significant conversion. Unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, depends on what side of the equation you're looking at this, uh, there are some very substantial uh, tracts of land throughout Southland that are being air tagged for, for uh, exclusive um, carbon forest development and um, that is quite significant in terms of e economic and um, the social benefits. We had examples in 2004 down the Catlins area, for example, with eucalypt planting. But um, it could have quite a significant impact on, on Gore District. That blue area that's shown there, um, you can't, we can't really see it at scale, but we will send through the detailed data, represents about 10,000 hectares of land potentially converted just in the above 15 degree slope areas, which is um, not quite 10%, uh, but a very, very significant, uh, sorry, um, a very significant part of the, um, of the local area, mm. land area, I should say. So we, we, will, uh, we will articulate this information. We ha expect to have it wrapped up early uh, next month, and uh, we'll be able to present the findings of that. Just uh, briefly. Digital mapping tools, uh, again, uh, it's a good example. We're using the information we've developed through the radiometric data, aeromagnetic data, and also digital elevation work to present some of these um, findings and use them as day-to-day -day tools. Uh, this, this work is ongoing, and again, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have around 13 different data sets available now for council to use routinely. Uh, the other work, uh, we've, we presented it to Gore meeting about three years ago, um, this chat information work that we were interested in, um, deep water ground uh, emergency water supply for, for metropolitan and other commercial use. Uh, we have now monitored, uh, we have a team of uh, hydrogeologists and um, geologists in our team, and, and uh, we've monitored now 2,000 bore sites We've found uh, 36 uh, bore sites that um, intercept the Chatham formation, and we've been able to look at formations that are likely to contain quite reasonable volumes of, um, of uh, fresh water at depth. Uh, the interesting part of this is that we have modelled that and uh, created a 3D model part of, you see a seg segment of it in the top image there, but, uh, and we have discovered that the, indeed the Waimea Plains um, aquifer systems the Tower Valley aquifer systems and the and the Arua systems appear to be connected and um, are reasonably significant. Uh, we haven't been able to determine water quality or otherwise at this stage, but we're working through that particular process as we as we speak. It is reasonably significant, I think, for long term. 
Uh, and that's uh, just in general sense, um, the advocacy work we've been involved with is primarily around um, TY Smelter, transmission pricing methodology and, and some of the interim um, submission activity, electricity pricing, um, legislative change, submissions for legislative change. We have just completed uh, the transport assessment, uh, economic assessment for Southland. Um, and uh, essentially since 2010, Southland has missed out on um, direct funding or uh, added benefit funding of around uh, $600 million. Um, and uh, we're hoping to build a business case to see greater investment back into into transport locally, particularly bridging and, and, and the likes. Uh, you know, efficient um, transport networks are critical for uh, a very efficient economy, and um, and uh, we just presented the first lot of findings to um, Southern District Council a couple of weeks ago, and they're keen to advance um, opportunities in this area. And I guess the other area is in the area of standards and climate change policy. There's a lot of mismatches between some of the legislative frameworks at present, and we're keen to see those righted. And uh, I guess in terms of digital services, I'm pleased to say that every square metre of um, Southland down as far as the snares and um, all of the offshore islands now have uh, ubiquitous broadband services, low latency, low, um, low latency, high capacity satellite services. That doesn't, um, doesn't mean that we can't do better terrestrially. And at present, we're just doing a re-evaluation of the current mobile services out to um, throughout the region and we'll be able to report back and I'm sure in our next um, report on that on that very topic. So um, I'll pass you over to Graham now. Um, I'm sure there may be some questions we'll follow up with the presentation. Um, can I just do a bit of a time check in terms of how we're going for the agenda? Just because we, we are... You okay for us to keep going for a... Yeah, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so look, I think you're also, um, you're all very aware of this project, New Zealand Functional Foods is our oat milk pr um, plant um, uh, uh, proposed for Makarewa. I won't dwell on it too much other than to say we're, um, I'm on the board of that um, representing Great South shareholding. Um, we're, we're in a very good space, but in, right in the middle of capital raise for this project, we've got some great investor interest um, and we have plant design, um, land um, and, and building design, all those things ready to go. So as soon as we get an investment, which we expect to be over the next two or three months um, confirmed, um, then, we're, then we're ready to press the button on construction. Um, it is, a as, as with many large projects, it's, it's slipped a little in terms of our original timing, but we're looking now at early 2023. So. Um, a significant project, as you know, been in the pipeline for a long time um, around in, um, encouraging and supporting land use change in the region. I'm going to touch very quickly on this, um, and it might be a, pro a, a, a um, content that we come back to talk to you about it in more detail at some point, but of course Mia Hicks is on the um, Enduring Oversight Group for the Just Transitions project. so. Um, uh, so you have an expert <laughs> in terms of this process around your, around the table. Um, uh, this is, of course, the process to support the regional transition. Um, and uh, while it was, it talks about the plan closure of the TY Point aluminium smelter. We kn we know with the announcement that they intend to stay open, that the government commitment um, is unwavering, regardless, and the, the just transition process will continue to seek diversification opportunities for the region. So I'm going to whiz through quite a bit of this stuff because it's detail. Um, the governance group that um, Mayor Hicks is part of uh, includes the, uh, these sort of represent the representation from the wider region um, uh, and sectors within the region. Um, we are an observer on the Enduring Oversight Group, um, but Bobby um, next to me is actually one of the project leads which we'll, which we'll talk to. Um, the work plan is an 18 month work plan uh, and our, our project um, is the, sorry, I think is the long term planning and capability on behalf of the region, which I, th I believe we've uh, probably talked to you about before. Um, I think I'm going to whiz through this a little bit. Um, 
and, but, um, and just focus on our project. Um, uh, Bobby's photo taken last week, Bobby. Oh. Yes, um, so we are leading the long-term planning work streak on stream on behalf of the region. We've received the contract, um, which is funded by MB through Just Transition Process. Um, and I want to make it really clear, and it's really important to us, that this is a, a Great South has the contract, but this, we're doing this on behalf of the region. This is a regional project um, by the region and for the region. Uh, we just happen to have the contract to lead it. And so Bobby has been seconded for 18 months um, to lead this uh, work stream. <coughs> These, this is what the long-term plan kind of looks like and stru structurally. Um, but I'll whiz through uh, uh, this a little to talk, to show you, if it's a bit small, we'll send this through, um, that actually we've identified and socialised with some of our key stakeholders um, the five primary areas of um, activity. And if I'm honest with you, I, even I can't read those from back here. So um, I won't uh, take, take you through these, but I do think if, if at some point we take the opportunity to come back and present it more thoroughly, um, that, that may be useful to you, so apologies um, for whizzing through. Look, look at th this is really the end. I just wanted to comment on the fact that obviously the draft statement of intent for, from Great South um, is with Council for consideration alongside our, uh, or with our other shareholders. Uh, so I know you've had that draft um, and we, we, I, won't, I won't talk talk to that other than, um, you know, we look forward to the f feedback soon on the draft, the content of the draft, as well as the, the budget that we've put forward to council. Um, these, uh, just, I think, just one more slide. These are the priorities, regional leadership, diversifying the economy, supporting business growth, promoting the region, and importantly, leading environment, uh, environment and climate change, which the team has touched on today. Right, so that's us. Uh, quite a lot of content there. Thank you for your time. We're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you yeah, for the Great South team. Um, quite a lot of information, <laughs> a lot of facts and figures and uh, yeah. a lot of diverse, diverse topics amongst that. So um, I'll, I'll open it up to the, uh, the committee and councillors whether there's any questions from the floor. Uh, no, thanks, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you um, to Great South team for that presentation. It's um, pretty slick, and uh, there was a lot going on. So really good to get that um, big picture, big picture view. Um, just a, a couple of questions, and I think this one is to Ben. Are you talking about the RSLG and the insight reports that they do and present up the line to cabinet ministers? Um, how widely are those shared? It's a very good question. Actually, Graham might know slightly more than me. Um, it's probably a question for MB as, in a way in, in how widely they're spreading those. Are they? So are you talking I at a ministerial guess, level? I, or I, I guess I'm asking from an RSL, a South and RSLG group. Yeah. Are they sharing those only with MB or do they get a local viewing? Um, I, look, uh, my understanding is uh, till, till now they've been shared with MB and front through MB to the minister, to ministers. So ministers actually see them. I don't believe they have been distributed mm. locally, um, but I think they absolutely should be. Yeah. And I suspect there's no particular reason why they haven't been, mm. other than they've just got into a process. So we'll take that away. Okay. Um, I, perhaps I can to, check on that and to, to get to, take get, to them, that, get it wider, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. And um, Steve, uh, really interesting to to know. There's been quite a bit of work completed around that you know, very deep aquifer network that we've got there. What, what sort of depths are we talking about there? Uh, well, look, it does vary depending on um, the particular location, but generally speaking, between 120 and 205 metres. Right. Yep. So it's quite deep. Yeah. Uh, well, well, actually, it is, uh, it is deep in a, in a southland context, but it's very deep in, in terms of water um, exploration and abstraction. Um, and other regions and and uh, internationally. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And just on the the um, sort of the, the broadband capability across across the province, and and I I know there's been a whole lot more added, but you, you talked about some of the the challenges still out there, and and I guess one of the challenges I find 
on a, on a personal basis, particularly from he between here and Invercargill on State Highway 1, there's probably 15 to 20 k's where there's nothing available. Yes. Um, and it's quite frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, um, you know, uh, me, Hicks, we've been working on this uh, for a long time, and you've been mm. working on that as well. Uh, it is extremely frustrating with the um, deployment of um, mobile black spots and uh, wireless broadband has been pretty slow. Um, fibre is gradually catching up and um, really what we're trying to do now is to identify absolute the areas that haven't been covered. Mm. Um, it's a um, centrally managed uh, process and um, I guess uh, we're the vehicle to provide um, input locally and uh, we'll certainly be reporting back to Council on that. Uh, we're, we're, we're keen to see that uh, those black spots and, and nulls in, in connectivity uh, filled. Great, thanks. Friends? <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions. There's one for Bobby. In terms of um, tourism, has it had a great effect on Gore, the, the COVID, has, has that had a great effect? Yeah, I think it depends on which part of the tourism sector you look at. So obviously the lockdown, um, that affected all businesses. Um, but your visitors were primarily domestic and quite strongly aligned to events as well. Um, what we're trying to do is promote people to travel around the region in different ways. So in, in places like Gore that have accommodation, and you know, resources and infrastructure like that are quite important to then help disperse you know, to other places. So yeah, I would say yes, similar, not as bad as some other parts of the region like Fiordland, mm -hmm. um, which were heavily reliant on international. Mm. Thank you, Bobby. Just another question. I'm, I see that the government is looking at the skills for um, people that are immigrating. Is that going to have an effect um, for um, our agricultural sector and bringing people into Southland. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, the reality by and large is that um, we need skills across the board. We have an ageing workforce and we have ageing work um, um, business ownership. Uh, it's implicit that we do have more, more skills and more youth entering uh, the primary sector, particularly agriculture. Um, look, that is a, the, the pathway to, to um, permanent residency hit will make a difference, um, but this is a total numbers game, really, across the board, and I think we still need um, quite substantial uh, new workforce. If you, we track, um, one of Ben's team actually tracks the number of jobs and types of jobs on a weekly basis, and typically we have between 700 and I think 935 jobs available in the region and we're certain that most, many of those are not being placed, not being filled I should say. Uh, we have a competitive workforce but uh, one of the biggest single issues uh, particularly for retention of youth at the moment is the cost and non-availability of housing. Uh, it's not, and, and so that is a, that's a massive challenge that we have to address. Um, and unfortunately, we have um, some fairly strong evidence to show that young people are moving away for that very reason, and we've got to address that. But they're the sort of people we want to retain in our communities mm. and families as well. So, yeah, it's not a straightforward process, but hopefully we're making progress in the right direction. Great. Thank you. I just have one other question regarding um, carbon farming. Yes. Is, um, unless there's a change in the government's thinking, it's not going to change, is it? Can you um, somehow enforce this for our district? Yes, I think the, um, the opportunity and the challenge for Southland is that 58% of our land area is in actual, in actual fact conservation of state or public lands. Um, our view is that um, in section four and other uh, lower conservation value areas that there should be permanent or um, uh, forest focused on this, these particular areas. Uh, likewise, in farmland, we, we, we think that the effort should be focused on wetlands, riparian strips and marginal lands. Um, the, unfortunate, uh, the unfortunate situation is there's nothing to prevent, in many cases, 
large-scale uh, forestry development. And um, unless there is some sort of uh, regulatory framework put in place to address some of those issues, uh, we can see significant um, change. Mm. And unfortunately, despite the very best of intentions of uh, communities at large, it comes down to individual landowners making individual decisions um, that affect them individually. And so um, you can't socialise that. Um, we've seen it with fishing quota and other activities where local communities felt they could manage the process and nobody would sell their quota and that just doesn't happen. So uh, we're, we're mindful of the, the um, effect that it can have. Um, it has two major effects based on other areas and one is that you have an amalgamation of smaller lots so you have fewer, fewer ratepayers across the board. Um, you have um, smaller communities that affect schooling, um, affects all other um, mission, you know, critical health services, etc. Um, so really what we're trying to do is illuminate this topic early so that we can have a proper and balanced conversation around the effects and advocate accordingly. And one of those effects is, of course, water yield from um, forestry taking up water. Yes. Going down in the tower as well. Very, very significant um, changes in all of those um, natural resource uptakes and so on. Yeah. Thank just, you. Just on that point, I guess <coughs> uh, it's a good comment you made there, Steve, around you know, communities needing to have a conversation on this, but like this is being rolled out as we speak. And I'm you know, just looking at that photo up there and probably... Um, from a similar vantage point, there's going to be quite a, a large-scale um, carbon farm in that area. Yes. Uh, so um, time is of the essence for for this community and for all communities to get their heads around what this means for us. And and I know that you know, I spent a wee bit of time in southern Southland looking at what happened with the, the eucalypts in the 90s, and it's not nice uh, in terms of effect on community. It may well be good in economic terms, but certainly in social terms, it's um, not particularly good at all. No, that's, that's, the, that's the essential issue, really. Is there any other questions from the floor then? Just um, in regard to the, uh, the draft statement of intent, um, a query in, uh, the elected members do have the ability to be able to put input into that in regard to any changes or... Um hmm. Yeah, so, the, well, I, I'm sorry, Anne, I'm not sure of the exact process that you you have here in terms of socialising that and giving feedback with the other shareholders, so can I so, ask you that? Yeah. So um, if our elected members have any comments on that, yes. it would be... Nice mm. to hear those so that the team at Great South can hear those today. Mm. Um, but if you're all happy with it, that's great. Mm. Um, from my perspective of working with Great South for the past year, um, I think we've made incredibly good um, inroads into Gore District's representation in all of the areas that they've discussed. So I'm actually very happy with how we're going. And I've mentioned from time to time to the Chief Executive, like, there's things that in our patch we want to do better, and when we can do them, those things better, um, mm. Great South will be able to do a better job as well for us, mm. um, and I'm working with Sonia on some of those things, and so I expect to see quite a bit of change on our side um, coming, mm. which then, you know, it'd be great to talk about the way forward with some of those things. So for me and my team, it's a really big thank you because um, at the start, you know, it was hard work for me trying to work out where we were going and what was happening. But I think we've done well, and um, so thank you from, from myself. So, yeah, for elected members, if you've got any feedback for Graham and his team, yep. it would be great yeah. to hear that. So, so just, just in terms of the <coughs> statement of intent, so it has its first hearing in a, in a public setting here for Gore District, but then it'll, th all of this will be confirmed <coughs> through a council meeting, so it will be um, an opportunity for anybody to have a, mm. an input into it can happen there. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. And thanks for those comments. And we've also enjoyed the, the relationship. And I think it is, um, the bottom line is it's producing better outcomes. Uh, um, so that's, that's um, yeah, it's great. Thank mm. you. No, that's, uh, that probably answers process and questions. So. <laughs> um, 
Any other questions? Any discussion from the floor there? Or just uh, okay. uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment, really, not a question. Um, it was quite interesting to see so many um, motorbikes and camper vans come down through, even though there was no Birch Munro. Mm -hmm. So obviously your campaigns are working and people are quite happy to make their own fun in a nice way. Thank you. We think that our campaigns are effective I and mean, there's a number of um, both hard data but often just anecdotal uh, ways that we, we hear that where people say we've seen that or we've come because of that. Um, but that's a very good example of the power of events uh, and Bobby touched on this bef before. Uh, and, and the momentum that creates and the fact that people are still coming because they wanted to have that break and that holiday despite the event not being on. Um, you know, it's good evidence of, of just the, the momentum, as I say, that those uh, that those events create. So, yep, we uh, I think it's really important that we keep um, uh, we keep promoting the region in a targeted and appropriate way, even through these very difficult times. Um, we've got to do two things: one, demonstrate to our businesses and our regions and our communities that we are continuing to support them. Uh, and for some businesses that's actually critically important that they see that we are doing that. And the other thing is there will be people making choices about coming, way fewer than there were before, but um, they, they will still make choices about coming, maybe but not now, but maybe in six months or nine months or 12 months. And that's why continuing to promote and profile the region um, is, is critically important so you don't actually lose your your, your place in the mind of consumers and travellers. Thank you. Um, any further discussion from the floor there? Uh, just one, one uh, question from myself. Um, in regard to that primary uh, sector, that workforce um, plan or program or work that had been done, and it's obviously MPI have ceased that funding, who, who's picked that up? Like, where has that gone to? Who carries that now? Because obviously, if we're getting 6.6 .6 billion out of our primary <coughs> sector, and as we know, in the climate today, they are carrying us. Yeah. Uh, so we. It's a good where, question. Where did that go to? Like, where, where's that ended up? Who? Yep. Who, so the, um, the workforce coordinator role it was initially set up to help with um, uh, all the roles that were going to be lost in tourism to transition them into um, the, the primary sector out of COVID back in 2020. That didn't eventuate. It just that idea just didn't, didn't happen. So the funding um, has has not gone into the coordinator role, but part of the funding has been picked up by um, a small company um, through Lindsay um, Stepford, and she will be delivering some of those um, um, presentations that I mentioned before to the to the primary sector community. So part of it is going to be carried on, which is which is good to see. Okay. Yeah. So, so so who's driving that then? Sorry? Who, who's driving where that goes? The, the primary sector. Yeah, the, the funding and that, that project. Who, how, yeah, how, do, how does that connect with the community? Um, do you know? Well, I guess we're not driving it yeah. as, as per se, but it's good to see a part of the program is still delivered. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, it is an unfortunate thing where we have these contracts with government where they do um, mm -hmm. finish at times. Yeah. So it's an MPI decision, I'm assuming, to mm. continue to fund that, that okay. part of it that we to, we had no right, right of. Actually. Okay. Just on, uh, just on that topic, the actual um, rural economy contributes just over four billion to the total economic activity of the region, um, and the other elements of the um, of our economy are made up by um, other commodities um, and uh, sorry, other services and um, construction and so on, yeah. Mm. Okay. Still chunk, 70%. Yeah. Mm. And the, uh, the only other point was that those data sets, obviously, with um, the CEO here, we, we'll get access to those because the fact we make a lot of assumptions around what's happening within our community, we, we tend to crystal ball and say, we think houses are doing this and we think that that's happening, we think, but obviously those data sets will confirm or or non, give us a non-confirmation of what we're actually thinking. So they, when are they going to be in the next three months? Is it 12, 12 weeks? Or um, look, the, um, the, the um, housing report data is, uh, is completed. Um, we 
uh, just waiting on some March end figures, which we'll introduce in, and unfortunately some of the uh, annualised figures are based on May end figures. So we're just, uh, we'll, we'll pass that over to Anne. Uh, I think with any of these activities, including the economic activity, during periods of um, quite significant change, you've got to revisit them very quickly. Um, we have another uh, revisit of the economic and demographic data in April, and, um, and these will just be available progressively throughout the year. In terms of land use change and so on, uh, we're uh, currently tackling work on a um, six monthly basis, and where there's detectable land use change, we'll be, um, we'll be able to indicate that um, within your region, within the uh, district, without any major difficulty. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, if there's no further discussion there, thank you very much for that detailed presentation. Um, a lot of information, uh, really interesting times we live in. You never know what you're going to wake up to some mornings, but um, we've just got to keep pushing forward and there's uh, some, some really good uh, projects and, and uh, developments on the horizon there. So uh, if I could just have someone move that that report's received. Uh, Councillor Reid, seconded Councillor Dixon. Thank you. The next agenda item is uh, the welcome plan, and I believe the community strategy manager and we've got our, is Mark still? I think Mark is probably still, still there. there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think they're going to lead us through this. Um, I see that uh, Councillor Grant have had some input into this too, um, Nick, but I'm not sure he's online, so, um, but if you guys want to lead us through that. Okay, so in front of you is the um, completed welcome plan. Um, this is here for your information. Our role has been very much a facilitation role as this plans a collaboration between Gore District, the Newcomers Community, Immigration New Zealand, Ministry of Ethnic Communities and the Human Rights Commission. There will be a large range of organisations that are involved in the implementation of this as well as other community members and groups. So the, the approach we've taken with this is very much a community-led approach, so not a top-down, it's a bottom-up approach from people that have been newcomers in the community and who have been mobilising themselves as, as groups um, to achieve things for themselves but actually require a greater voice in our community. So the process has really been about understanding their voice, their experiences and some of the potential solutions that they see um, to make life better here, to enjoy their life in Gore District, but ultimately for us, so that we retain these people, that they don't just come here and be here for several years and then leave. So um, we, have, we held a workshop, we also did some survey work, and through that has been the development of the plan. And I guess the four things that have really come out strongly in this is the integration assistance that's required, the need for better local community information for newcomers to our district, bridging the cultural divide and the involvement in activities. We've had some excellent feedback at a national level on the plan because I, um, we are leading the way with this plan. Uh, and I guess because we've taken a community-led approach more than a top-down and developing it with agencies. The agencies are an important part of this plan, but it's now that we actually have it from a community perspective. I have um, given you today a, a document that actually shows the submissions that we received, and those submissions have, have been viewed and um, the changes to, and taken changes from those for the plan, and the reference group have done that. Going forward, we're in, intending to further develop the reference group, but we're in this phase of um, consolidating the approach, really. So the next thing that we'll be looking to do is to prioritise the high actions and start to work on those. So the intention is that I'll continue to facilitate the group um, but Mark will be leading the work. 
Now, Mark, I know you were there. Do you want to make some comments? Um, thank you, Anna and Mark. Uh, obviously, I'll open it up for di discussion, but uh, before I sort of go into that, um, I'm aware of the amount of work that has gone into this with the various um, outside groups and plus the work that's been pushed through from uh, with, with the assistance of the council. Um, and the, the outcome document is, is you know, it's, it's really good. Like, it, you need to be complimented on the standard that has been produced here. It, it's aligns with the other documents that we've been receiving sort of over the last year through through um, our uh, community strategy or through the through the work that you're doing. So you need to be complimented on that. Um, there is some good uh, feedback there for the councillors if they go, th go through that um, and have a uh, read through there. There's um, quite a lot of dialogue um, around various issues. Uh, but uh, I'll open it up to the councillors for a discussion or questions. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chair. I haven't had an opportunity to look through this one yet, Anne, so forgive me if I miss something. But big congratulations to you and Mark. Um, it's, it's a very good, clear, mm. concise document. It's written in plain English so that there's no... You can actually... You want to read it. It's, it's a really good plan, and I'm... Delighted that our council's the first one to pick up and run with it. Um, I did have a few comments, and I'm prepared to be told that, yes, we are doing that. One of the things that I see the, um, the people who could be involved, there's, uh, unless I have missed it, um, no mention of churches. I know that in the community, for a lot of newcomers, sometimes that's their first port of call. So some of the members on the working group are connected to church groups. Good. Um, but this is the, the next phase, as Councillor Reid is actually bringing in other groups. And what we're anticipating is more a hub and spoke a model going forward. So there's going to be some projects that relate more to some groups than others. Mm -hmm. And so what we're wanting to do is mobilise more people um, around the group, but keep the reference group. But then some people put their hand up and said, we would like to participate in a particular project. Mm -hmm. So we expect each project might have, you know, six to eight, ten people. And that's when some of those groups will yeah. get more involved. But there is connections already there. Um, and the workshop actually was held within one of the churches. But I think one of the important things about this is um, we're looking forward to when we have our community rooms here because actually mm. we want to have spaces that are inclusive for everyone. Mm. Thank you, Anne. Um, just a couple of we things. Um, you were talking about retaining um, people in the community and to my way of thinking, the one person who is often the hub of the wheel between family work and partners is the female in the family. And... Um, I just I know they quite often feel isolated, and when they do come to our communities, um, you know, kids go to school, hubby goes to work, and they're on their own. So, is there a specific plan going forward for those people to be um, engaged with and taken, just sort of under the wing of some people in the community? Mark, do you want to comment on that, or do you want me to? successful um, group which has grown in numbers of late. 
terms of isolation as well, what we're hoping to do as part of this plan is to set up a, um, a database which um, uh, real estate agents, churches, schools um, can contribute to by acting as a conduit and connecting those newcomers if they wish to share their details with us and then we can approach them and um, moving forward uh, make sure that they don't feel that sense of isolation. Thank you, Mark. Once again, congratulations. It's a really, really good document. Excellent, thank you. Look, I, oh, sorry, Dennis, go ahead. I uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I reiterate what um, Councillor Reid has said. It is a very well-written document, and congratulations for that. As I know a lot of work has gone into it. I'm wondering um, how... <coughs> I know we're in the process of sitting, setting up um, neighbourhood watch groups, whether um, those people in the street that are nominated to be the spokesperson could be involved in this somehow as well, so we're not missing out on people in isolated areas. Um, I think that's a great idea and um, we're in discussions with CNT around you know, what projects will work together on. So I'm sure those things will start to develop as we as we get into the implementation phase. Mm. And I just want to add my congratulations. This is stunning. Um, it's a stunning document. Uh, there's been some real um, heavy duty work gone on behind the scenes to get it to this point in time. Uh, and you're only to be congratulated uh, for that. I guess um, a question I have is around uh, how do we share this information with our wider community? Um, I guess we're, this is, this is focusing really on, well, absolutely on newcomers, um, but for that to be successful, um, we've got to have the buy-in of those like me that have been here all our lives. So how do we do that? So we've already had it started having some conversations about which comes under that area of integration mm -hmm. of um, what exists already here that we can mobilise to introduce newcomers to. So, I mean, that's quite a large piece of work and, um, you know, we're yet to develop up the detail around that, but we're certainly starting to have some conversations around it. As far as the actual plan goes, like it will be on the council website, um, it will be available, but I think what's going to be of more interest to the community and the newcomers are the individual actions and how we proceed with those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, uh, absolutely. But I think um, there'll be a, a large section of our community will be interested in this and they'll be actually um, stunned to see the, the depth and the quality of this. Mm. So uh, and while I'm very mindful of costs and, and what have you, and digital is, is the way to go, it has to be there, but but also hard copies mm. uh, would be really good. Mm. Uh, just with this one, just to be able to pick it up and open it up mm. is but, you know, invaluable. So mm. I don't think we can, don't we can, we can lose the, um, the input that a um, hard copy can have. Mm. And we've had some discussions around that as far as um, a welcome pack, that yeah. some, some people yeah. would like that to be um, digital, but a lot of people would like that to be, you know, a hard copy. But you've also got to consider the language yep. issues we might have as well. So, those are things that we'll be working through over the coming months to get solutions that we think will work for the community. Councillor Reid. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just down to the welcoming packs. Um, a good point, Anne, about the fact that you know the digital's not always the best way to go, but included in those packs is exactly what? Just information? Sorry. So it, it depends a lot on our community, but we don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So mm. there are already some good databases that have a lot of the information around clubs and services. So what we'll be wanting to do is direct people to the appropriate places. Mm. We're certainly not going to um, redo work that already exists. Yeah. 
Yeah. I understand that. So it, can, it, it, it varies, but what we'd be wanting to do is give them a sense of place for a start. What is Gore District, you know? Mm. How does it operate? All of those types of things. I mean, there's a, a, a range of initiatives that have been discussed. Should we be having, you know, some sort of, um, whether it's a welcome afternoon tea for newcomers so that, you know, they can meet locals first off. Mm. And so there's a whole raft of things that can be put in there, but it'll be general information around the district and then pointing to them to locations where the other information already exists, which is a little bit like the little booklet that somebody just held, held up before, um, which has been done with the focus audience of a 65 plus market. Mm. So we'll do something that's with the focus of a newcomer. What do they actually need? What are the questions that they want to know? And there is a project um, with Gore NZ website that Sonia is leading. And, and so we've been talking and thinking about what else do people need before they actually get here, but then once they're here, mm. yeah. Thank you, Anne. One, I, one thing I wondered whether or not um, if included in those packs physically is um, the opportunity to perhaps have a free pass to the aquatic centre, Mr EO, and possibly like movie tickets or something like that, just because Quite often families are so caught up in the rush of arriving, new jobs, new schools, and there's always that plan to go somewhere, but if you've got a free pass, even just for the kids or something. Wonderful mm. idea. Mm. Thank you. Um, and the other thing I want, <laughs> I see first up here on the list, the action was English language lessons, and I wondered will that also include um, translation of some of our local colloquialisms. So Mark might like to comment on that because he's already done quite a bit of work in this space. Yeah. One of those teachers has offered to uh, do that translation in Chinese uh, to English free of charge and indeed offers um, English lessons free of charge as well, which has been hugely valuable. Um, I, I'd just like to come back to your uh, point about the welcome, um, welcome kit as well, um, Councillor. So we also have in the plan an opportunity for newcomers coming to town to walk around the town and be introduced to the different um, points of interest by people uh, who currently live here. Uh, one of the councillors has already put their hand up to do that. Um, we also um, have supported companies looking to attract employees into the area by meeting with them at the um, info centre and just giving them um, yeah, an overview of what to expect, where they go, what they can do. Um, and that's been hugely successful actually in attracting So, any further discussion from the floor there? No, I think uh, we've probably covered off everything that needs to be stated regarding a um, well presented document. I, I do agree with um, His Worship that uh, it's a good showca showcase document that could be in hard copy, and maybe it is up to um, up to the councillors themselves if they get copies of this that they actually go out and place them in the various places that they believe would be. Um, mm appropriate for people to access because we all know uh, enough people, we're all embedded in the community and we know where people pick up um, pick up the uh, closest thing to them to have a read while they're waiting in a, in a dentist or the, the doctors or um, the theatre or wherever. So um, I think that would be a good, a good suggestion but uh, we're also mindful of the financial implications mm -hmm. with that. Um, so all we need now is someone to Someone can move that, that uh, this report is received as it is. Uh, Councillor Reid and seconded Councillor Dixon. And uh, thank you once again to Mark and Anne and all the other um, various groups 
and uh, individuals. I know um, from some of the, the workshop that I attended with a lot of individuals that were there from uh, diverse cultures, um, mm -hmm. fascinating and, and really keen on having an input. So, yeah, they can all pat themselves on the back with what we've got here today. Okay, moving on, we have Ab uh, Item 4, which is the Ready for Living Progress Report. I see Kylie down the back, so welcome, Kylie. Uh, so, I'm, sorry, Mr. Chair, I just, I, I'm not sure who's looking after Zoom, but we've got somebody waiting yeah. to come in. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, I'll be the, the, the 80 plus. Yeah. Yeah, if, if we're happy to move through, we can get Martin to put that through. If uh, we could go to the next agenda item and come back to four, if the councillors are happy with that. Yeah. yeah. No, he's not there. <laughs> Okay, well, no, we'll, we'll continue with technology. We're trying to be too smart for ourselves, so it always happens. Um, we'll continue with Ready for Living. Kylie. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've just got a report about... Oh, am I really allowed? Ready for Living and everything that's been going on in the last six months. So I've been at council now in the role for six months. We've received lots of positive feedback and I'd like to highlight some of our successes. So um, I've just picked a few points from the report to read out. So we've now got two years confirmed funding from PH Vickery Trust to continue um, my role as coordinator. I'll go over. So we've had some feedback on loneliness um, has been identified as an issue from community members. However, it's been hard to identify the lonely people for us. Um, there are a large number of social groups available for older people. So Ready for Living produced the booklet that you've got in front of you, um, a guide to local services and connections for older people um, to help the community be aware of what, what's available. So it's covering things from medical services, support at home, transport, social opportunities, and support organisations. Um, so that has gone out last week. We started publicity, and from today, it's in the newspaper next week. I think I'm on the radio tomorrow, so that's going to be good. So we've taken it to senior citizens and the RSA lunch, and so there's lots in distribution as well as at the library and our main areas, medical centres, so we've um, placed them around. So it's been a cool project to get completed. Um, over 80 is free parking. We've had over 160 people receive their permit. So that's from last community strategies meeting, or it might have been the one before, last one. Um, that, that was brought through, so it's been, um, Really good to see people picking it up and real good feedback around that too. Um, as a coordinator, we got contracted by REAP to run a Better Digital Futures for Seniors class. So we did some computing classes for older people last year, which was an interesting experience, let's say. <laughs> um, I'm not continuing doing that at the moment. <laughs> Um, and we also have been advocating for the older people in several ways, but when the vaccine pass came out, there was a bit of uncertainty around how the older people would get it. So we looked at, before we heard the pharmacists were good doing it, because it seemed to come in quite late when that knowledge became public. So I organised um, different agencies to get together and help that and promoted that in the newspaper and 
on the radio too. So that was awesome. And I also helped at the library doing vaccine passes as well. Just one last point that I'd like to highlight. So International Older Persons Day, we had some awesome plans, including a mural tea party that we were hoping to invite councillors to, um, which was something that was over um, overseas we'd seen. But of course, with COVID, we had to stop our plans. So we did have four page editorial on the end sign for International Older Persons Day. Um, we were hoping for two pages and we had so many businesses support. We had four pages of content come up at the last minute. So that was awesome knowing that the community is on board with the project and knowing um, about supporting older people. So, yeah. Mm. That's, um, thank you, Kylie. Um, obviously, there'll be a couple of questions from the discussion from the floor there in regard to some of our successes. The, the uh, Someone will probably ask it anyway, but the 80-year-old um, parking, what, what number of, do we have or how many pe up. people do we 800 have? 800 and... So it's only about a 25% or... Oh, wait. How many had licences? Yeah. That's not in this report. There was, what was there, 800 people total, maybe? And, oh, I can't remember now. 500 had licences? I had that number on the top of okay. my head, but I don't... I'm just interested to see how many people have taken it up. Mm. I know that I did speak to uh, an 89-year-old the other day who hadn't taken it up and was, was oblivious to the fact that it existed, so... Um, yeah. They will be getting it now, but, um, yeah, it's... It should... Should we do a uh, follow-up? Like, have we, have we re-advertised, or I know we did some media around it, communications? Um, we haven't at this stage, but yeah. it is something we could probably yeah. look at and do. Around this booklet, I know when I was talking to people and we're flicking through, it came up for a couple of people, and I've got a couple of permits to deliver around to help older people. As well as that, some of those people have the wheelchair card already, and we didn't have those numbers divided. We couldn't get that data okay. in as well. Several of those people aren't driving, um, so it's that balance of yep. the stats not being very accurate as well with who decides to have the permit. Um, the but I still think 100, 160 yeah. is still yeah. a, good, a very good uptake. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll open it to the floor for discussion. Well, uh, Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, look, this is really good. It's a lovely wee booklet, and I'm sure it's going to be picked up and read. And and obviously that's something that could also be included in the welcoming pack, isn't it? It's, it's, it's there, really well done. And, and yeah. lots of good things happening in the community um, to do with um, the older, older people that we have in town. Um, just lovely to know that they're being looked after so well. Mm. So, yeah, job well done. Thank you. It's reassuring as one gets older and oneself. <laughs> I didn't like to say that. <laughs> well done, Kylie. It's um, just fantastic and it just continues to build on <coughs> what has been a, a really good foundation and goes from strength to strength. And yeah, w well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Kylie, um, I, just, I know there was some discussion around housing about looking at older people that are in a big, big home in the area and talking to them about moving to a smaller home or has that happened or? I'll pass that to Anne, she's moved on to housing for me. <laughs> um, the answer's no, Glenys. <laughs> um, the discussions that I'm having around housing is really in the social housing space. Uh, I guess one of the things is that there's a lot of older people that love their big homes and don't see the need to move to smaller housing, which is always going to be a challenge for core. Um, but no, we don't have any initiative at the moment around housing, making changes from a, an older person's point of view. We have been having some discussions with um, the current services that are here and just building an understanding of what is here and what's the demand. Um, any further discussion there? 
No, look, I'm, I'm happy to move that the report be received, Mr Chair. Okay. Seeing that Councillor Dixon. Um, no, that uh, is very, very, very informative. Um, we've got some great, got some great, um, great initiatives on the go, and that have been uh, have actually been implemented. So you, you're um, leading the way there. Um, the only query I did have just before we moved that was that uh, ha how often do we update that? Like, what's the, the? It'll be like a living document because you'll have to, yeah, you know, every year yeah. there'll be further services or changes. So. Um, so I think we're talking six months a year, depending, especially after this first one, there might be a few changes and more feedback from the community. So we are looking for community feedback on how we continue with it and the best way to have it um, produced. So we will continue to update. But a uh, very informative document and great, as you say, to go in that welcome, welcome pack as well. So I thank you for that, uh, Kylie. Uh, moving on to our next is Martin, we're in the 80 plus, aren't we? Um, page now. Uh, the next agenda item is the the 80 plus uh, free swimming at the Aquatic Centre. So um, we've got Martin there. He's got Kylie. Oh, I and Kylie, I've sorry. Got Martin. <laughs> yeah. Go. So, uh, Kylie again and Martin, if you've yeah. got them there, can lead us into this. Martin there. Um, I'll do the proposal, but Martin's here to answer all the questions. <laughs> the hard stuff. Um, so, our proposal that has came through our steering group, but lots of community feedback, um, is that around the free swimming for over 80. So our proposal is to allow people 80 years or older to use Gore Aquatic Centre with no charge to swim and attend aquafit classes. Swimming and aquatic exercise is a great low impact exercise for older people with many health and well-being benefits. Many studies have proven swimming and aqua aerobics have many benefits for older people, including improving cardiovascular vascular health, reduce risk of falls, improve sleep, boost mental health, and is, on, is gentle on the joints. The pool is a point of social connections for many older people, which adds further benefit for their well-being. Local pool staff see older people making these connections on a daily basis. Um, free swimming for over 80s will encourage a larger number of older people to swim, and helping them maintain health. The times of day older people swim are generally not peak times as they aim for the quieter times when children aren't about. Um, and the free swimming would acknowledge the contribution to our community that many long-standing ratepayers have made. The proposal includes free swimming and aquafit, but not the swimming masterclasses. So some stats, that are getting old now, our next census mustn't be far away. Um, from 2018 census data, the Gore District had 2,616 people over 65 and 750 over 80. The number of users over 80 attending the centre is hard to determine exactly as casual users are only classified as over 60. Um, so in the past year, 140 1,389 seniors over 60 have used the pool. Um, the previous year total was 4,803. So, yeah. So the Gore Aquatics has 20 swimmers currently over 80 years with annual memberships. Um, the, this equates to an annual income of 8,000 uh, 8, per annum. The annual membership is 400 individually. Um, there's some breakdown of the pool's income and what comes from over 60s in that report. Um, there are not many other aquatic centres in New Zealand that have free swimming. 
for over 80s, so it would be great to be a leader in implementing this. Um, Timaru Council is one that offers free swimming for the over 80s. Um, so our proposal is to provide Gore Aquatic Centre users aged 80 years or older with free access to swimming and aquatics classes. Um, the implementation will be quite simple around the um, centre's staff just checking an ID quickly on the way past or if they have a membership um, just citing some form of ID and we'll do a report back after six months of implementation to review number of people over 80 that have used this. Uh, thank you, Kylie. Is, um, Martin, do you want to add anything else to that? Yes, probably just to report um, that as you'll see, the numbers have quite the Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, so, councillors, we have a uh, proposal there which obviously will go through recommendation through to full council, but um, is there a questions discussion? Uh, Councillor Reid. <laughs> Thank you, um, Councillor McPhail. It's, it's a great idea. I'm really excited to see this. Let, just and as long as the money's not an issue for the um, our income, but uh, I can see that this apart from anything else from the wellbeing point of perspective, with people being able to go physically um, look after themselves, but also have contact with other people. And I think that's really important. So yeah, brilliant idea and initiative, and um, I'll be very happy to move that, as a, move that report to take to council for ratification. Mm. Okay. Councillor Dixon. Um, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, Mr Chair I'm very happy to second um, the recommendation I just I think it's a great initiative and I think those people that are 80 actually deserve to have free access they pay rates for many many years most likely in the district um, it's just something that council can do for them that's like a thank you and, and it's good for them to keep fit and their well being so happy to second that okay. thank you Jane. And, um, yeah, Mr Chair, i just echo the comments that have already been made. I, <clears throat> I very much support this. I think uh, a point that was raised about income, uh, I think with you know, one of the challenges councillors have, and it's a perennial challenge, is balancing cost against value. And I think that this particular item uh, is quite starkly weighed on the side of value as opposed to cost. Uh, so I, I very much support it. Uh, thank you, councillors. Uh, I think we've probably passed that um, motion there that, that proposal will go through to full council. I agree with the commentaries that have been stated. Uh, obviously, the green prescription that comes from swimming, mental health, physical health, um, you know, there's, there's all those attributes that, that go along, along with the uh, social aspects. And hopefully, if I'm still here when I'm 80, I'd be quite happy to go and have a dip. And your worship, I think you'd be have a pair of speedos somewhere, wouldn't you? Hidden away there when you're hidden away very deeply. <laughs> <laughs> but no, a great, a, a great, a great initiative there, um, and I'm sure that we will uh, have some favourable support when we get through to the main council as well. Uh, thanks, Kylie, and uh, thank you, Martin. Keep up the good work there. I know we're working through some um, difficult uh, times and restrictions and various things, and uh, the crew are doing a great job. I was in there last week, and uh, yeah, now everything seems to be functioning well. So. 
Thanks very much. Um, moving on, uh, we have Kylie again, uh, our age-friendly business uh, initiative, the AFB. Um, if you want to lead us into that. Yep, so yeah. we're just going over re-establishing the age-friendly business initiative. And I did find that we had put it in our first report when we were looking at bringing the project to council ready for living. But I'll just go over the initiative for you. Um, the Age Friendly Business Initiative recognises Gore District businesses and organisations that aspire to be age friendly. The initiative is part of the Re Ready for Living project. The Age Friendly Business Framework and Toolkit for Gore District has been developed jointly with the Gore District older community members, businesses and services. The initiative supports Gore District businesses, services providers to adapt to an ageing population and to better meet the needs of all customers and clients. Participation, participating businesses focus on business self-improvement in four areas, environment and accessibility, communications and information, respect, inclusion and product and services. The aim is to create a business environment that is accessible, a customer service experience that is inclusive and respectful, and to offer products that meet the needs of all customers and clients, whatever their age, life, stage, and ability. Businesses can show their customers, clients, and community that they are committed to a journey of learning, self-assessment, and continuous improvement and support older and support older people in the community. The Age Friendly Business Initiative is an easy self-assessment of how a business meets the needs of older people as well as the whole community. Being age friendly is good for customer and client satisfaction, for the business bottom line and the customer retention and growth. Um, why do businesses need to be age friendly? Businesses can no longer take the 50 plus aged customers and clients for granted. More are living longer and staying healthier. As the older population grows, so will its spending power. And so examples of what businesses could do, and some have occurred and some ideas, um, provide appropriately, appropriately height seating. Um, that includes armrests not being too low. Um, doors easy to use with pull push signs or even automatic if possible large font on things like brochures. Um, it was even mentioned in the group, the wee barcodes in the supermarket with prices on. Many people have to put their glasses on, so that was a point brought up. Not making assumptions of what you think older people want, um, such as always wanting the cheapest item, such as gym shoes or a printer. Um, not yelling or talking slowly to them. Products. Um, so Paul at the theatre changed some times in movies to mid-afternoon and he's got a good following of people that can come in those time slots. Um, giving options to change the hairstyle, not just thinking that they'll permanently want that same perm, was something brought up. Um, having an answer phone message that is clear and concise. Um, so seven businesses have taken this initiative up, included Connected East and Southland, Gore Counselling Centre, Ministry of Social Development, New World, High B, St James Theatre and Triton. Um, with the pending Omnicrom outbreak, I wrote this a week ago, <laughs> um, we have made this decision not to make a firm plan on when to start publicity of the age friendly business. Originally it was going to be starting in February till June um, with planned publicity for the radio, newspaper, business events, Facebook and Antenno. It is important that all council facilities are age friendly and complete the recognition process to show that council is committed to lead and acknowledge age friendly to support older people. Um, individual sessions are planned to have with all the council facility managers. Businesses have identified to start approaching have been identified to start being approached and will be given a flyer with information about age-friendly business. Um, this will be followed up with communication and meetings. 
Ready for Loving will reassess the situation and have everything in place to start when it's safe to do so. Um, so it's a simple four step process of self assessment, creating an action plan, filling in two documents to receive an aspiring to be age friendly logo and reassessing progress yearly to make changes. Um, the coordinator can assist businesses as they work through the program. There's no deadline. Um, and it's a re recognition, not an audit, so they won't be inspected. Um, I just want to say part of it's that uh, um, what's good for older people is good for everyone. So even though we're looking at older people, it will benefit the rest of the community, having people think outside the box and develop products and making things more accessible for those in prams or any other disability as well as everything else. Uh, thanks, Kylie, for that. Um, any discussion or queries from the floor? Questions from the floor? No, it's really um, interesting the comment that you made regarding COVID because I dare say that a lot of um, older people or our, our elder citizens um, with various poles, cones, dots on floor, um, stripes, stand here, don't do this, don't do that. Um, it is a difficult time for them, um, and you actually, I, don't, I know even from myself, you, you're not quite sure where you're meant to be some days, whether you're talking through a piece of glass or, um, and probably it's what uh, our elder members of the community confront, have confronted every day for a, for a long time, the shops they probably wouldn't go into because it was just such a, a navigation navigational issue to, to get from not knocking something off the, cow, uh, the, the, the shelf or um, causing a scene or causing yeah. a problem. So um, I think it is one of those things that you tend to forget uh, when you're younger, but as you get older, you start to understand the, the issues that strike us. So um, if there's no discussion, oh, no, Councillor Reid. No, not a discussion, just a comment that um, I think it's a great plan. It's good that businesses are already signed up, Kylie, and, and taking advantage of that. I mean, little things do help, you know, just even a clear path to the counter sometimes. But often too, as we age, that equals invisibility. So I think it's good that we're working to work with those people in the community that um, will actually benefit from this. I'll move the report. Yeah, I'm happy to second that, and I was encouraged by uh, Kylie talking about opportunities to change your hairstyle, so I'll keep that one in mind when, uh, when the time comes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, don't change it too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a few adaptations. Thank you, councillors. Uh, and uh, moves on. Thank you, Kylie, for that. Um, you've had a, a few items there, so you can breathe easily now. hope you've through the dragon's den. Uh, our last uh, item here is obviously uh, from our community strategy manager in regard to a progress report on how we're doing and where we're going and what we're doing. So I'll hand it over to Anne. Okay, I'm not going to go through everything in the report because some of the things you've already heard about today. But I guess um, it was suggested to me that I should just give you an update a year on into the job because it came in November and it's a bit past a year, it's 14 months. But um, the first part I would say was focused quite strongly on past projects and things that um, mm. either needed a bit of a revision or um, a refresh. Uh, there was quite a strong focus on the establishment of relationships with community organisations and government agencies. And of course the establishment of the community strategy team, which includes myself, the community empowerment coordinator, Mark, um, pastoral care coordinator Nancy, and that's a contract through to June this year, and Ready for Living coordinator, which you've heard from Kylie today. Um, Meryl Task Force for Jobs definitely took quite a lot of my time in working out mm. how do we actually do this, and I'm pleased with the results that we've had. 
and I've just actually spent the last five days working on um, a photo shoot. Two of those days were scoping and three were actually shooting with a professional photographer. Some of that work was all around employment and um, work that will prove beneficial um, in trying to attract people. But one of the things that was really nice feedback for me to hear was both from the young person of how much the program had actually benefited them. And at the end of some of the shoots, some of the young people came and approached me and actually said thank you to the council. Mm. Um, so, you know, people really have appreciated it and so have the businesses. And I guess it was very inspiring to see the quality of young people in these jobs and mm. them loving what they're doing. You can clearly see they're really enjoying mm. the work. So that was um, really nice for me to see that um, first, you know, hand today and yesterday. Um, we're sitting at, a, I think, around 39 placements and we have about another six or seven contracts uh, in negotiation at the moment. So we have the, the 50 is the target by the end of June, which I think we're easily going to surpass. So we probably won't have enough funding to support all the businesses that would like supportive with the young people. So that's on top of the 50 from last year as well? Yes, mm. yes, that's right. Um, you've heard about youth sector today, you've heard about welcome plans today. Um, when I first came here, I did quite a bit of work in the event space and working out a strategy for council. There was a couple of main objectives around that, was making sure that we understand the reputation Gore has as far as an events uh, and arts region or town and district. And the fact that we are the events capital for Southland and have some really significant events. Um, and that, you know, to, to maintain and grow that, it has to be resourced appropriately. And of course, it's been a really tough year for the team and events because of COVID. But a lot of amazing work has gone on in the planning um, that won't be lost. We've heard from Great South today. Just transitions, I've started working with Bobby um, on the process and making sure that Gore District is well included um, in the report that goes to government, I think, by the end of April. Uh, international students have been approached by Gore High School in St Peter's to, for in a discussion about the international students that come to Gore District and, you know, when COVID's behind us, they will want to um, attract more international students and how can our organisation assist with that. Just make a comment on the Trout Project. Um, I have the first draft on my desk. I'm yet to start reading it. It's a significant document. And um, right through the process of getting to that draft, have been working um, with the consultants um, on that. They've done a huge amount of research, both in Gore District, around New Zealand and overseas for this project. So the intention mm -hmm. for me is now to go through the draft, get any changes that we think we need, and then it will be back to the working group for the input to see what, what the next steps are. Um, we had the workshop on district identity and how to build an identity and the challenges between our three positioning statements. Um, the brown trout capital of the world, the New Zealand country music capital and rural city living. Uh, so there's more work that needs to be done on those. And then attached to this report is the Community Strategy Work Plan. So this has come out of Ready for Growth. So you'll remember we had the workshop that we reviewed Ready for Growth and elected members commented on what was no longer relevant in the plan and what should go forward into a work program under the Community Strategy team. So that document's attached and I don't think that there will be anything on there that would jump out and you would be surprised by, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Anne, for that. Um, obviously, we've had quite a few of the projects sort of dis discussed today, but uh, I'll open up the discussion or comment from uh, Councillor Dixon. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just a comment, Anne. It's great to see the progress report, and I think... Um, it's great to see the projects that you're involved in and pushing Great South to recognise school. That's important. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm the same, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. But you know, the progress has been significant, and uh, the value that that Anne has brought uh, to this part of our operation uh, is is significant. So, thank you, Councillor Reid. 
Thank you. Yes, definitely, and your input is across all of those things, and, and obviously the fact that you've driven and you can see that big picture where sometimes other people may be too close and just that oversight that you provide is extremely good. I would ask, but where do you think the future lies? Do you see any other projects or, or holes that need to have something organised to fix? <laughs> you are a fixer. <laughs> oh, I think the biggest challenge for you in this space is resource, because the resource is people, and without mm. money attached to projects, it's really hard to make progress. Mm. So um, where possible, we're accessing funding, and you know, like that will limit the our ability to mm. deliver. And so that's why the partnerships with people is really, really critical um, to see what we can achieve in mm. partnership. Yeah, and I, we did discuss, I think, in the workshop around community planning and the need for community plans for our smaller areas within the district. I think the most important thing around that, we, we don't have that on this work plan at the moment, is that community planning needs to come from the community in the first instance. And should we get any approaches, we're open to facilitating those those types of projects or sector plans. Mm. But I think for now, what you see here is what we know about and um, mm. people of the community that have asked for support. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think from my perspective, what's really important is to not have that much that you can't achieve anything. Mm. Yeah. I think you've achieved a great deal in a very small space of time. And I don't know, Steve may want to comment on that as well, I'm not sure. Yes, thanks, <coughs> Mr Chair, and I just want to endorse the, the uh, comments of councillors. What we want to do, uh, do here is to really put out to the council the, the pathways that uh, Anne and her team have forged in the last 18 months, and to give some clarity about what we're doing, because it's, it's fair to say when Anne came to the role, there was a lot of uh, historical effort, but perhaps it lacked a bit of focus, and there were a lot of people that had input into some of those earlier plans, but this is now uh, taking a lot more refined view of things, uh, and has actually done a, and has done a bit of um, cleansing, as it were, in terms of quietly retiring some things and accent, accenting others. Uh, and there's, I think, a lot more comfort, certainly I get, uh, in talking with Anne about <coughs> where the priorities lie uh, and where the opportunities are. And, but also, as Anna said, that um, the, the more successful you become, the more need you, there is for questioning whether you've, you're adequately resourced to actually advance these initiatives in the, mm -hmm. in the time of um, time frame and pace that you would desire. So that's no doubt a discussion that we'll have at estimates time. But um, I certainly endorse the comments of elected members that Anne and the team have really started to create uh, a lot of impact in the community. And I think that's a key thing that I'd say is that the networks that um, they've created in the community are quite different, really, than what we had 18 months ago. Uh, and that really touches social, economic, and cultural, so it's, it's fantastic. Just another question. Do we need to blow our own trumpet a little more to the ratepayers to know, let them know exactly what these initiatives have led to? Just a thought? Yeah, it's, it's obviously one of the things that you've got a, um, um, a small team that's putting out a, a big, big input. Um, and probably from the fact that if you, if you cut a tree down or you put a new bit of concrete down on the ground, everyone drives past it and sees it every day and comments on it, where a lot of this work is um, fluid. It moves within the community. It creates value. It creates um, systems and networks that happens and they, and they form. Um, and they develop and they grow, uh, and a lot of that isn't seen. Uh, and there's certain probably parts of the community that won't notice it or won't see it, but they'll benefit from it. Um, so I'm not sure how we showcase it or how you actually uh, put it forward. I think this plan here, uh, well, the work plan clearly outlines where we're going and the, and the volume of work and the volume of projects that we're involved in. So. Um, I know it goes on to our hub and through our comms, but I'm not sure 
whether we communicate it more. I know we, um, media-wise, we try and utilise as much as, it, as we can. And, um, anything you'd like to add to that about how you showcase it more or, or blow our own trumpet, as you say? Probably our team's not a team that is into blowing your trumpet. We just like getting your work done. Um, I think when we look at some of the initiatives you know, if you look at closing the gaps, we've definitely had a really strong comms plan around it and key messages that are targeting both youth and targeting the business. Um, so I think people are very aware of that piece of work. I think um, we're doing the same with the work we're doing in Ready for Living. We've um, definitely got a strong comms strategy around those pieces of work. Some of the other work is probably still a work in progress, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, we can certainly take those comments on board and maybe with Sonia's help work out things that we could profile more. Mm. Mm. So, oh, sorry, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through you, Mr Chair. Um, and I think it would be um, great to get some of the Youth Council ideas on opportunities and, and ways forward. And one of the things I'm thinking about that they have been involved in is waste. Um, I think it would be ideal to get um, to get them involved. They probably already are. We can certainly um, further advance those things. They certainly have been involved in some projects, but I know Mark's definitely got plans to um, lift the leadership coming through from the Youth Council this year. Mm. Yeah. So just uh, uh, taking up on a, a question that uh, Councillor Reid asked, Mr Chair, and you know, what does the future hold? And it is a, a really good question. But I think the, the investment in, in time and energy and, and money uh, into what we're creating here is going to serve us very well as, as the future of local government changes. And, and that's something we haven't really considered too much uh, as a council, but it's probably something that the community strategy committee should be turning its mind to, is you know, the, 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 the panel that are considering the options to put to government about what the future of lo local government holds, I think, leads very much down the track of what we're doing now. Um, but, you know, that's something that perhaps the Community Strategy Committee could turn its mind to, just to, um, you know, in a way that we can educate councillors about what the future looks like and educate the community as to what the future looks like. You know, we've got two significant parts of our of our operation, both um, water delivery and, uh, and planning uh, and, and resource consenting are likely to be um, delivered outside of a council operation. So what does that mean for us as a council? And, and there's, there's a lot of politics in this, absolutely. <clears throat> but when the politics are, are done and the dust settled, then it's going to have to be the, this organisation um, delivers whatever the requests are. Okay, um, good commentary there uh, in regard to that. And as we said, we've got a good good team, a really good team here putting out uh, some big input, uh, big output, and uh, yeah, much appreciated from the, uh, obviously the council and the community. Um, could I have someone to, Sorry, oh, sorry, Max. <laughs> Uh, thanks for that, Mark. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, looking right, looking left, and looking behind. <laughs> Look like I think I'm in the driver's test. Um, if we just have someone to um, to move that that is uh, our work plan and progress report to be received. Uh, Councillor Reid, seconded by Councillor Dixon, and uh, 
yeah, once again, thank you for the uh, thank you for the quality and the standard of work that you guys are putting through. Um, it's, it's a very very high standard. Um, with that, uh, that's the end of our agenda. So uh, I'll call them unless there's any more. I didn't actually ask if there's any late business or no. Um, I'll call the meeting to a close. Uh, thank you for your attendance, councillors.